Welcome to Shannon's Lifestyle. This week, I'm honored to have Mr. Douglas Crawford, one of the top Las Vegas criminal defense lawyers, also known as Las Vegas trial lawyers, right? Yes, ma'am. To be on our show. And thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you, Shannon. It's an honor to be here. Well, well, we, we know, know that, that you're all over a newspaper and everything, and everything but I would still like you to share a little bit of information about yourself, about yourself your background, and where did you grow up? Thank you. I, I'm a lucky guy. I grew up on a... a lucky guy. I'm a lucky guy. <laughs> okay. I had a great life. I grew up on a ranch in Northern California, a very tiny town called Tule Lake, California. My grandfather and grandmother homesteaded there in 1938. He was a World War I veteran. The U.S. government awarded homesteads, 80 acre pieces of land. All you had to do was locate to the land and farm it for three years and you owned it. So we started there. He raised his family there, including my father and my uncles. Uh, and then uh, I grew up there as well. My father bought our, our own uh, piece of land in the, in the 60s. So you were like a farm boy? Farm boy, farm and ranch. I grew up on a working farm. We farmed potatoes and grain and raised uh, usually a, a steer or, or two and uh, so you know I grew up, I grew up in, in a great place. It was a good place to be as a boy. It's quite a different lifestyle from being a lawyer. Big time. And what, what made you want to become a lawyer? I realized very early that I had no major gifts in life. I was not a great, <laughs> well I wasn't a, a great athlete or anything like that but I knew that I could talk and I thought, literally, when I was in about seventh grade, I thought, what profession could I engage in that would utilize my persuasive skills? And I immediately thought of being a lawyer, and I ran for class president in seventh grade on the plank that I would become a lawyer someday, and I won. And that, that has been your wishes since yeah, then? Yeah, right? I knew early that I wanted to be a lawyer. So everything else thereafter was kind of good, because when I saw my other uh, friends struggling to see what direction they were going to take in life. It never was a question for me. All through high school, all through college, I did three years in the Army as well. All through that, I knew that I was going to go to law school. That's so much more ambitious than me. Because, because I remember when I was around that age, all I wanted to do is, because I saw those people who selling tickets on the buses, I'm like, that's so fun to be able to play with papers all day. I'm like, that's what I want to do in the future. But anyhow. <laughs> that would have been worthwhile too, Shannon. I see you. Pushing papers, yeah. Right? That's, that's fine, fine, that's fine. fine. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> and, um, and so then you directly just just wanted to be a lawyer, and yeah. you went and you actually a go-getter. You know? After, uh, after yeah. I graduated from high school, I went to the mailbox to, uh, to get my acceptance letter to the University of Oregon. When I opened the mailbox, I saw that there was a letter from the Department of Defense. I literally thought, why would the Department of Defense be sending me a letter? And I opened it up and said, greetings, you've been drafted into the United States Army. So. That threw a monkey wrench into my plans, but I enlisted in the U.S. Army for three years instead of got drafted for two years. I lived in Europe in the, in the U.S. Army for three years, traveled all over Europe, had a great time. I had a great time, so that was a great experience. So wonderful. I bought a uh, $300 Volkswagen Beetle my third day in Germany, and I wow. drove the wheels off that thing. I went to every country in Europe. So I had a, it was a good education, too. For an American farm boy to be exposed to Europe was a beautiful Correct. thing. And it, and it taught me a lot culturally. Opens up your eyes. Yeah. So then I got out of the Army and enrolled in college at a small school called Southern Oregon State College. It was a tiny liberal arts college in Ashland, Oregon. Mm -hmm. Went to school there for four years, got good grades, uh, partied a lot, had a good time. And then got accepted into uh, McGeorge School of Law, University of the Pacific, and attended three years of law school in Sacramento, California. Okay. Um, and how was your law, like, like law education experience? Law school for me was not enjoyable. It was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. I had always been a big fish in a little pond in high school and in college. Grades came easy to me. But when I got to law school, only it's like a small fit, like in a big pond. It's like creme de la creme were accepted, and everyone there was as good, and most of them were better than me academically. 
So I struggled. I, I did okay, and uh, my grades were above average, and I graduated from law school in three years. But I have to say, it wasn't as enjoyable as college because I had to study and work too hard, but I still had fun. Okay, and talk about, um, you know, after you start to, you know, after you graduate from school, and then you just immediately moved to Las Vegas? Ah, that's an interesting story. Uh, in law school, they pair you with another law student for the whole three years of law school. That's called your trial advocacy partner. So you kind of like play against them or, you, or kind you, of with, with, them. With, them. with them? With them. You team up and you try cases against other teams. Okay. So you learn trial advocacy, how to litigate in court. So my trial ad partner was a guy named Rich Smith. And Rich Smith was a Las Vegas native. So after we graduated from law school in 1984, he said, hey, you're, You're a great partner. Come to, you have Vegas and together. Partner. Come, to yeah. come to Vegas and party. So I came to Vegas. I brought a handful of resumes. And, and which year was that? It was 1984. 1984. And that was still like the old Vegas? Thing? Old Vegas. There were uh -huh. only 350,000 people in the city of Las Vegas. Oh, wow, you must have a lot of fun. It was good. <laughs> the times were good. It was right at the beginning of the boom. So I came uh, over the hill from Sacramento with nothing. I mean, I had a load of student jet. I had a teeny little Honda Accord, a uh, Honda Civic or something like that. I had the smallest U-Haul trailer that they make that held all of my worldly possessions. Everything I owned fit in a little trailer. Wow. And I had $500 and I had a lot of it. So I came into Vegas, got a teeny little one-bedroom apartment behind the Palace Station. Uh, it's called the Petty Apartment, little Kuparacha place. And uh, that was only, I think it was $170 a month for rent. It was all I could afford it mostly. I got a job as a law clerk for a large firm. Then uh, after I passed the bar in 1985, took a job with other attorneys to learn how to be a lawyer. The difference between me and many of my peers mm -hmm. and the kids now is that many of the young law students who are graduating from Boyd skip that interim step and they go straight from law school to opening their own firm. That's a big mistake. You have to learn how to be a lawyer. Law school does not teach you how to be a lawyer. It only teaches you the, the way to think. It teaches yeah. you how to think like a lawyer. That's very perceptive. You're the first yeah. person that understands. Because, because to me, I would think it's the same thing as a lot of other things. You know, when you really get to the real world, that's really when you learn the real experience. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So I got to be mentored by one of the greatest lawyers in the history of the state of Nevada. Uh, he was a uh, Nevada uh, Supreme Court Justice Michael Cherry. Mm -hmm. He taught me how to litigate, how to do criminal defense, and how to do a divorce. I practiced with him for several years, and then in 1989, opened up uh, my own law practice, and from 1989 to the present, I've always had my own solo law practice. And um, can, can you share with us one of the most, most um, let's, let's just say the most high profile, profile or maybe like, like one of the cases that, that you're most proud of? Those are really two different things. I've had some very high profile cases over the years. The most high profile case I had was I represented a woman named Shante Kimes. And the reason that I can speak about the case is because she is deceased now. She died in prison. Uh, she was accused of kidnapping uh, women in Central America, bringing them into the United States, and she kept them prisoner in her home and literally sold them to other people as slaves. That wow. case, you defended I, I defended her in a civil case involving the, maid, the people she kidnapped, suing her. And that case, I represented her for six years, and I've been interviewed just about every year for the last 20 years on that case, wow. on all the national TV shows. So that, that's, that's my most high profile case. It was an interesting case because she was such Evil that that's what I was going to get to. Like, I mean, what if, what if, a, you know, like one of your clients, and you do believe that she's guilty, and you do have to defend her? Is that something you still have to do, right? Of course, it's so misunderstood, and I'm not sure why people don't understand this point. Our Constitution guarantees you the right to a fair jury trial by your peers. The only attorneys mentioned in the entire U.S. Constitution 
our criminal defense attorneys, the Sixth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, gives every citizen the right to representation at trial, even if they can't afford it. So it's my job and it's my pride to represent people accused of crime. Just because you're accused doesn't necessarily mean that the government or the state has sufficient evidence to prove your guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. So everyone's entitled to good counsel. And it doesn't matter whether they did it or not. That's the part people don't understand. How can you represent him if he's guilty? I've heard that question 10,000 times in the last 34 years. And the answer is this, because I believe in the fairness of the Constitution, and because it is not my job to ascertain whether the defendant committed the crime or not, it is not my job uh, to, to necessarily uh, you know, put forth a story or, or anything like that. It is my job to make sure that the prosecution follows the rules and fairly prosecutes you. If the prosecutor does their job, then the defendant gets convicted. Have you ever turned down a client before? Very rarely, yes. Occasionally. And, and well, when would you say no to, to someone that you don't want to work with? I'm going to be really candid with you. Usually it's when you don't have enough money. <laughs> <laughs> that is very honest. I appreciate that, Doug. <laughs> but, if, but, if, but if they have a sufficient fee to get me through trial, I'll usually take a case. And I've taken some horrendous fact patterns. I've handled many rape cases, uh, murder cases some disgusting human beings. But, but the problem is, everyone, every citizen who is accused of committing a crime has the right to have that fairly tested by the trial process. It doesn't matter whether they actually did it or not. Yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting. And you also were presented for um, some of the mafia guys? I have. Oh, oh, in old Vegas? Yeah. One of my... Can you share some? That sounds really interesting. It is really cool. It's yeah. a fascinating case. Um, and this uh, is a case uh, that occurred in the late 1980s. I represented a, a man whose name I can't mention right now, uh, but he was a, a high profile uh, man connected to the New York families. Uh, and he came up with a scheme where he was going to take over all of the escort industries in Las Vegas, the sex trade and operated it for the New York mob. In order to do that, he used some kind of high-tech stuff where he was diverting phone calls. But when some of the owners of these escort agencies gave him difficulty, he had to enforce the will of the New York families, and he did that through some brutal means. One of his uh, henchmen was a, a guy named Vinnie Conjusi. And oh. his, his nickname was Vinny the Aspirin's Conjuicy. Now, ask me, who Doug? Why did they call him the Aspirin's? Because when a mob had a headache, they called Vinny. Oh, <laughs> okay. so he aspirin. is a guy who... Vinny was yeah. the, he would solve mob problems. So when they busted Vinny, uh, the, the most horrendous part of the case is that he had a duffel bag. And in the duffel bag in his car, was some duct tape, some rope, uh, a handheld butane torch, some wow. dental tools, some needleless pliers, some handcuffs, uh, a hood wink to put a hood over some. So we had a built in kind of torture kit. And that's the method that the mob used. I got that case dismissed. I successfully defended it. Really? Oh, and that, uh, that was a fascinating case. Oh, my God. That was on the front page of the RJ. That was interesting. And talk about criminal defense. I think, um, you know, we also we also know that you also do the divorce and also the child custody as well. Um, you know, I always have a question for lawyers who actually does divorce cases and child custody cases. How would they ever have the courage to actually get married when they see so many nasty marriages around? That's a great question. Why do you ask? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, and I will tell you, honestly, it has weighed on my mind. Because every client who has ever sat in front of me at my desk and asked me to handle their divorce, at one time, they stood on that altar in that church, and they looked up at the heavens to God, and they looked out at the audience, at their family and their friends, 
and their loved ones, and they swore eternal love and the binding together of their two souls for eternity. Right. And then five years later, they're sitting in front of my desk saying, I want you to cut his head So, to answer your question, I have always viewed marriage very skeptically. I've never been married. I have had one long-term live-in relationship with a beautiful woman who's still my dear friend. Uh, I don't have any kids. Uh, but I have, but at this point in my life, I've kind of mellowed. I think that at this point, I'm 64 years old. But you mm -hmm. know what? I think I could get married. Maybe. Okay. Well, well, let's do a commercial for you later on. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> so that's it. So, um, so would you say that you're more like a marriage counselor? Like, because I think that's what, you know, when marriage couple come here, they would say their problems. And, and I mean, in order to actually, you always try to help them you know, discuss, discuss with each other instead of, like, going to court. court. So, so would you say that that's one of your roles? I mean, I'm just, just kind of... It is some divorce attorneys. Mm -hmm. It's not one of mine. Okay. Uh, and I view it differently than many of You have a very different now, style. If a couple asks me to, I will mediate and attempt to even for reconciliation. But that's very rare. Usually when they get to the point where they've hired me, they are looking for a, a, a true advocate to go in and quote unquote defeat the other side and obtain the most benefit from the divorce process that helps them. And that's what I do best. I'm known as a kind of a Rambo litigator, a cutthroat courtroom guy. I like to tell my clients that when we go into court, uh, there's not going to be anybody standing up with you and me at the end, and you're going to get what you want. It doesn't always happen that way. But we have a very good success rate and we do well. You know, I, if people ask for counseling, I send them to an outside counselor. Okay. That's why you are kind of like, name, I mean, that's, that's why you were named as one of the meanest defense lawyers. Who said that? <laughs> I thought that's what you said. All right. So let's talk about your, let, let's talk about your own life. I know that, you know, as um, very successful lawyer yourself, you actually went through some really big life problems. Can you, do you mind share some with us? I've been, been open, open about, about it, it. Yes. and, uh, and uh, I'm proud to be open about okay. it. Uh, I've been diagnosed with, uh, with drug use disorder, alcohol use disorder, and gambling disorder, formerly called addiction. Uh, the, the professionals now in the treatment area no longer use that term because it's so value laden. Right. And the thing is that the public misunderstands that it's important to know about my conditions is that we're not bad people. We have right. a, it's right. a so, to so, say it's a disease. Right, and, and is that, that the reason why you got this far? It is, uh, but it's even worse than that. Uh, as part of my gambling addiction, you know, I've been, let me start from the beginning. I, it's fair to say that I had a drinking and drugging and gambling problem for many yes. years. It accelerated and it got really bad to the point where I gambled away virtually all of my money, millions of dollars, everything I own. The last money left was a few hundred thousand dollars in my attorney trust account. Now, that money doesn't belong to me, it belongs to the client. But it has my name on the account, so I took that money and gambled that money away and then didn't have the money to repay my clients. Be sure they're honest so that's that. stealing. I was always honest about it from day one. So that caused an emergency suspension, and then I went through a bar hearing. They disbarred me, but I appealed that to the Nevada Supreme Court. And the Nevada Supreme Court unanimously reversed the state bar and said, you were wrong. You should not have disbarred Mr. Crawford. He showed that he had mitigating factors, that not only was he a good practitioner, and ran an ethical practice prior to the addiction. And there was a time that he almost killed us all, he said? Yeah. So I got addicted, uh, and and uh, but the Supreme Court reversed it and reinstated me so I could practice law again. But yeah, that culminated about September of 2007. Uh, I woke up after a long bender and was uh, alone in my house, and I was trying to think of who I could call. And I realized that my addictive behaviors had alienated everyone. I didn't have friends. I didn't have family. 
didn't have anybody. So I was so depressed, I took my shotgun and put a shell in it, laid down on the living room floor, and thought if I can't uh, think of a reason to live in the next few minutes, I would blow my head off. Um, well, I'm, I'm glad you're here now um, and at a better place, and everything is going well. Um, it is. Well, I'm, 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 ha I've ever been. I'm having a great time um, talking with you and love to learn more, but I, we do, you know, we are running out of time. Okay. Um, and, you know, maybe a, this last word, um, can you just um, tell our audience where we can find you and also, um, you know, what's your name and, and all these good stuff? My name is Douglas Crawford. The name of my firm is Douglas Crawford Law. Our address is 501 South 7th Street, downtown Las Vegas, at the corner of 7th and Clark. My telephone number is 702-383-0090. And uh, my website is www.douglascrawfordlaw.com. Um, if, if you can use one slate to describe um, you know, something to make people who are seeking for legal help, then please go ahead. Share with us. We provide a higher level of personal service than the big firms. I give you big firm service for a small firm price. Okay, sounds great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Doug. And it's been a great pleasure. Thank you so I much. I know, I know. Thank, Thank you so much again for being on the show. Anytime. Again, this is Shannon Yang. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week. Oh, don't forget to write to me about your thoughts for the show or if there's a place you'd like to see in the town or if you think your business is a real highlight of Vegas life and want it to be featured. We always do a lucky drawing among the viewers at the end of each episode and send out different surprises each week. No strings attached. So maybe you're the next lucky winner. Thanks for watching Shannon's Lifestyle. Don't go away. We'll be right back.